This is the WGBH Forum Network. And one thing I have to say I'm fairly optimistic about is that the first time I've actually seen the unions cooperating is if you've read, if you've read the trays around any of the, you know, downloading, you know, projects that are going on and people are previewing programs online and before broadcast and all of this. Um, the, the, for the first time, the unions are actually talking to each other and cooperating. And that can't hurt us on some level, because right now we have collective bargaining agreements with actors, writers, musicians, and we don't have Directors Guild, but there's some, of, some stations in public television that do have, that are signatory to the Directors Guild agreement. They all define the rights differently. They all have different work rules. They all have different residual frameworks for which to pay. So the fact that they may be getting their act together and cooperating on some of these things I see as a good thing. And the union issues for us are as much of an encumbrance as the copyright issues that Jamie spoke about yesterday. The other thing I wanted to point out is stock footage in Stills houses, the archives. And I know Rick is very, I think Rick is very unusual in the work that he's done. They also don't talk to each other. And they all have these ridiculous long lists that look like a la carte menus, which I'll reference in a little while. Each one defines rights differently. It's impossible to figure out, I mean, if you're, if you're dealing with a show like American Experience, which could have 40 different archives in one program, each archive is defining it differently. You don't know what's included where. And the one bright point I have there, which I'm feeling very optimistic about, which I just found out about this week, we're a member of a group called AXEL, which we were actually a founding member, member of. And AXEL stands for the Association of Commercial Stock Image Licensors. And all the big licensing groups are there, the BBC, Getty, ABC, NBC, Nat Geo, and GBH is, is, is amongst them. And they're getting together because they're finally, and actually I have to say, we probably have planted that seed maybe a little bit because our representative, Al Allison Smith from our media library, is our staff person on that project. And I'm constantly going to her and saying, Allison, how are they defining this? And she'll say, oh, well, you know, 15 of them are defining it 15 different ways. And then she takes our comments and questions back to the Axel group. So I think partly, maybe in some small measure, as a result of the amount of pushing that we've been doing, Axel will be announcing shortly that they're going to do a white paper on the history of licensing. And they're going to look at how they've gotten to where they are and with, an, with, a, um, with a clear uh, signal that they recognize that the world is a changed place and that convergence is happening and that maybe they have to start doing business differently. So for me, that is, that's like nirvana, you know, when you're, when you're in this space. Okay. So here we have rights. So here, here, you know, as I was just describing, this is, these are kind of all the sources and availability of rights. And this is whether you're producing a drama or a documentary. These are the full complement of rights that, you know, or, or most of them that you're going to be dealing with. You're going to be dealing with actors, writers, directors, musicians. You're going to be dealing with composers or published music, underlying literary stocks, footage and stills, and originally produced material, which might include animation. Each one of those have, has a set of gates around it that are different. But nonetheless, there are gates that we have to open up. I mention music in particular because rights in music and pre-recorded music are particularly complicated. And my colleague Jake Fial Jay Fialkov in our audience is, is someone I look to for advice and guidance on these complicated rights issues. And they're particularly complicated because you have different sets of rights under the copyright law that you have to deal with. Rights not only in the underlying composition, but rights in the fixation or the recording. And I'll talk a little bit more about that too. This is a, you know, this is current distribution platforms as of last week, and I'm sure there's five more that I could probably add today. But this is, when we're looking at all these complicated rights and, and the, the restrictions that each of them present, this is the kind of rights um, uh, platform that we need to be in. So when we're looking at television, we're looking at broadcast, cable, multi multicast. We're looking at um, on demand. So we're looking at not only cable on demand, but internet on demand. We're looking at education. And as you look at these rights, just understand that everybody that we deal with defines these rights differently. And that's part of our challenge. And if we're going to look at these rights and figure out how to be on these different platforms, we have to start having some consistency between and amongst the definitions. Because if you have different definitions of things, it, it's almost impossible to figure out. And let me, let me just tell you a real life example that we had. <coughs> As schools migrate to getting content, no, schools used to get AV delivery, educational delivery, in hard copy. And now everyone's delivering, or a lot of companies are delivering them, pro full programs electronically, just directly to school servers. So if we're clearing AV rights, some of the old definitions include a reference that it be on a tangible hard copy, because that's how it used to be delivered in the old days. So, and those old days weren't so long ago. We're talking like last year, okay? So you have a, you have a de definition of AV rights, which says you, can, you have school rights. In that same release, you have the right to put it on the Internet. But on that same release where it's defining what the Internet is, it says no downloadable rights. 
Okay? Now, in order to send it to a school and to put it on their server, somebody has to download it. So you've got AV rights, which say that you have school rights, but, and you have Internet rights, but it says no downloading. Do you have the ability to put that content into that school market? That's the kind of chasing your tail kind of analysis that we are going through all the time. Okay, our goal, this is our mantra, this is what we'd love to see, all rights, all media, but you know what, no one gives it to us anymore. You might get it from some funky little archive in Portugal or something, but that's about it. So the challenges, as, I've, as we've talked about, everyone's looking at these things on an a la carte menu with a, with, a, with a focus, though, on how things are being delivered rather than how the end user is using the content. If I'm sitting in my living room, does it really matter how that content got to me, whether it came on my PDA, whether it came on a cable, whether it came through satellite, whether it came through over-the-air broadcast? Does it matter? Why, does it, why should it matter? And why should I pay separately for each one of those things, which is exactly what we now have to do? So if I'm sitting in my living room, all I know at the end of the day is that I'm sitting in my living room watching television. It's only for my own personal consumption. I'm not selling it. I'm not engaging any kind of commerce around that relationship with that content. But we're paying for it as if we are, because we're paying for it. If those are five different platforms. Each one of those platforms is going to cost something to get it there. And these guys are all figuring out how to do it. Now, copyright presents its own set of unique challenges, and I won't bother reading this because everyone has a sense of what copyright is. But the one thing that we should understand is that the current copyright law does not really understand or reflect the need for changes in the digital technology environment. Now, in 1976, in recognition of the limited resources that were available to public television, Congress did give us some benefits, and they're very good and important benefits. It gave us the 114B exemption, which we drive a truck through and which is very important to us. And it allows us to use any sound recording for public television purposes without permission or payment. And that saves an enormous amount of time in terms of the clearance process, because you put it on a cue sheet, you deal with it, and that's all you have to do. And then you have Section 118, which is a compulsory license, which le allows us to use non-dramatic musical works. And there's also provisions for pictorial, graphic, and sculptural works. That's never presented much of an opportunity for us. But what's huge in this is that it really gives us the right to negotiate rates through the CARP with Ask FBMI, Say Second Harry Fox. But so no permissions required. And the rates are predetermined and predictable. So even there, it saves us a lot of time and energy. But the problem is, on the next slide, is you'll see that both 114B and 118 both require a connection through a non-commercial educational, educational or public broadcasting entity. Today, public television is more than the over-the-air over broadcast. What is the impact of these? And we think that, as, as Jamie was talking about yesterday, we really have to start blowing these exceptions out to expand not only the scope of the rights covered, so maybe stock and stills and everything else in addition to music could be covered, but we have to be um, expanding what it covers. And as Lou, I'm not going to try to uh, touch what Lou was talking about, but Lou dealt with the editorial issues beautifully this morning when we talked about you know, the impacts on editorial and the impact on our ability to secure uh, consents and releases if we push too much for open content up front. So how to unlock these rights? Extend the scope of the copyright exemptions and compulsory licenses, as I just talked about. Develop new approaches to licensing and standardized definitions for new media. And I have tremendous hope that this Axel group will do a lot in that regard, and I still will we'll push on the union side, but we have a lot of work to do there. Now, engaging the talent unions is an interesting thought because the part of the problem is there's nobody home in the talent unions that you can talk to. You call them up and they're so fixated on what's going on in the commercial world and all the money that they think that they're losing that they're not paying attention to public television. Whereas the talent unions and the, and the BBC in the UK, the BBC is a big employer. We are too small in the United States to get any traction with them and it's very hard to get their attention on these issues. Now, what I've talked about for the mo most part is taking programs currently produced or archival pro pro programs and, and showing you the barriers to open content. So what you'd have to do as you, as you do this analysis, you have to really consider your evaluation of each element. And you have to think about, as Lou started to talk about, well, rights holders agree up front that each element can be included. And if you've produced your program so you're not doing it up front, what will be the impact if you go back later? To ask them if you can now kind of rip, mix or burn either the entire program or segments of that program. So not only are we looking at the legal issues, but we're also looking at the moral and ethical obligations to original interview subjects and content suppliers. 
if you're producing original open content, so you're really not relying on the infrastructure of the industry that exists now. You're not relying on third-party archival material. You're not going to hire union talent. You can use originally shot material, which is why you see a lot of the kinds of things on YouTube that you see. Uh, originally shot material, a lot of public domain material you'd have to use. You would use non-union talent, but then you have to think about what are the implications from an editorial point of view about using that kind of content only. We have two very exciting projects at GBH that are open content. It's a sandbox, which Don Abbott will talk about more tomorrow. It's, it, we can demo it. It's a beta. It's a blog. But it's our first step kind of in this space, which we're very excited about. And it's an initiative of the GBH lab and invites users to play with some of our content. And it's an opportunity that we have to open up our archive to, to broader use. Teachers Domain is an established educational online service that we have. And with a grant from Hewlett for our current life science unit, we will have 15 to 20 media assets that will be, have to uh, be available as open content. And as part of that grant, we will also research what it would take to put the prior 900 assets at make them open content. And what I'm particularly excited about, and Eric is going to talk about it, is that this is our first opportunity in Sandbox to use a CC license. And we thought long and hard about should we, you know, maybe try to change it or whatever. And the fact is there are a lot of benefits to working with a CC license. And the one that we selected, obviously attribution, but for Sandbox, it's non-commercial derivative share alike. And that's the only thing I want to point out there, for Sandbox, it's material that we wholly own. So without third-party encumbrances of any kind, largely B-roll, so it's a lot of butterflies, it's some interesting scenery and all, but that dictates the kind of content that you can put in that kind of environment. And my final slide is Teacher's Domain, which will hopefully perhaps use a modified version of a Creative Commons license because there we need the educational imprimatur on that because the underlying clearances for the segments that we're using are based on from whether it's a union or stock or stills, whatever, it's based on the fact that that will be in an educational environment. And here for Teachers Domain, our team has done a fabulous job of looking at, 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 at putting as much content, making it as open as possible. But what they have to look at is varying levels of open, how open is open. And we have a range from zero to three, zero being not open at all, it stays, it can only be uh, streamed online to uh, the third category, which is it can be downloaded, reused, and remixed. And the characteristics of that footage and, and which is why it has to have those three categories, is that it's from multiple sources and some of which have restrictions. And that's all I have to say. Okay, I'm going to borrow the internet connection here and talk about um, a little bit about Creative Commons. So I want to show you some of uh, what's going on. And I know that many of you know about Creative Commons, but it's been um, described enough so I think it would be helpful to um, go over some of it. And also, I was watching, uh, like all of you with amusement, the um, uh, mashup of uh, terror, 9-11, uh, 9-11, terror, uh, et cetera. And I also felt like we were doing that with Creative Commons. I've heard so much about Creative Commons. So I want to uh, show a little bit about Creative Commons and see, make sure we understand what Creative Commons uh, can do and can't do. So here's the, uh, oh, I'm so sorry. I already did this, but it expired. Do I need help? I did. Yeah, no, it's hooked in. Oh, right, right, right. Who's got the Ethernet cord? Oh, John, okay. Thank you, John. John may have been working earlier on. Okay. Can you work on this while I talk? Great. So let me first uh, take a minute and respond um, to some extent to what uh, Lou Wiley was talking about. Um, I, I haven't met Lou, but I was um, happy to, to um, hear him describe that side of, of uh, the problem and um, why uh, we need to talk about it. Um, I was a producer at CBS News and also an independent producer of news documentaries. Um, and the issues that he um, cared about, I certainly cared about a lot. I made one program in um, Seattle years ago about a criminal case with cameras in the courtroom, um, which was a first. 
at that time and followed uh, police and lawyers um, and on both sides. And uh, I had been a lawyer, a public defender in that jurisdiction, and the police said, you know, we sort of know you, but we're not sure we want to trust you with talking to our people. You might twist it. You, you sort of uh, wouldn't be the first time. And the answer that I had for them, which, which um, I'm not proposing as a, uh, as a template, was just to say, um, I'm going to make a video and audio recording on videotape. Um, if you feel in the, when the show airs, if you've been treated unfairly, I will provide you with the audio recording. And then if you still feel you've been treated unfairly, I will give you the video and the audio, just because it was cheaper to do the audio. And you can go to the press and say how unfairly you were treated. So it seems to me that um, if you are trying to gain permission for an interview, you might have the same answer to people. It's not a complete answer, and it certainly won't, may not make um, uh, somebody comfortable uh, like the woman whose child um, died, but it may make other people comfortable. And as we move to a kind of new world and new relationships, this may be the type of thing, um, it may be the best you can give them. Is that it? Thank you. It may be the best you can give them. Um, the reflex is certainly toward uh, uh, for most of us against openness. Um, I made a program in Miami uh, about a police shooting and, uh, or police abuse case, um, uh, beating, and cover up, beating to death and cover up. And I needed a uh, footage that the local stations had shot, not their footage um, uh, anywhere except in the courtroom. And the claim that they had made when they got permission to, um, to take that footage was that it would be open the purpose of it was so the people could see how the courts worked. And of course, I got down there after the case, uh, after the trial was over, and I wanted that footage. And they said, oh, no, no, that's our footage. Um, I ultimately got it. But as a producer, one has that, um, or most of us, I think, have that instinct. Um, we feel if we don't have exclusivity um, in a legal agreement, at least we, ha we have some feeling of a proprietary um, or, or just ownership, even if it's only emotional ownership of the programs that we work on. So um, I'm with Jamie Boyle on this, saying we need to examine all of the reasons why we want to keep things uh, less than open. But I am also understand what Lou is saying, that there may be times, um, and not just a few of them, when the answer is not turn it over to the world and let people do what they want with it. So I would almost propose for the editorial department and for the people, um, other people at GBH, GBH who work with them, to have a kind of, um, uh, as somebody said, a default uh, rule that the material is open unless uh, individuals can make a case for uh, keeping it under some other types of control. It could be a kind of um, uh, keep it closed impact statement. And it might be uh, like an environmental impact statement. And if you want to keep it closed, you have to explain to somebody why and be able to defend your reasons. I think GBH could certainly develop a list of, uh, 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 with some real back and forth, uh, um, a template, a criteria that one examined to see if something should be um, open to the world or not open to the world. We're not at the rights question yet. We're just at the question of should something um, be open or not open. So let me go back to Creative Commons for a minute. Um, Creative Commons was actually incubated at the Berkman Center. Mm, what's my code? This is DRM right here. Yeah, just tell me what it is. I'll type it in. Okay. Um, Creative Commons was incubated at the Berkman Center um, about uh, four years ago. And um, one of the dirty little secrets about, the, uh, about Creative Commons um, is this one. Um, Sue is sitting here, and she has to worry about um, WGBH's liability. When we uh, looked at how we might build Creative Commons, it, the idea at start was very different from what it became. But when we looked at it, we figured out a way to limit our risk and liability. And the way that we did it, of course, was that we don't host any of the material. 
Um, we provide the tools and we provide uh, the sort of uh, legal code and we provide a site that people can go to and get inspired. Um, but we are not the hosts. So if if there's a question about whether someone had the right to use a particular work or whether that, uh, that it was that person's work at all or whether it's defamatory or any of those issues that lawyers worry about, the lawyers at Creative Commons figured out a way to throw up our hands and say, well, it's not our problem. It's the, it's the Tom Lehrer version of uh, Werner von Braun. Um, on the other side, we expected all kinds of uh, debacles, and we've seen um, very few of them. We expected um, liability issues to arise, and um, there have been very, very few of them. In fact, um, no liability issues. Um, the funding issue, uh, before I move to funding, I, I want to stick with the risk for a minute. Is Josh Nathan still here? Oh, good. Okay, this is a little unfair, but Josh, some years ago, called on me to speak at his group, so here he is, and I'll ask him. I was talking to Josh last night. Josh is the general counsel of WNET, um, also a large producer of uh, content for PBS, and a partner in work with uh, GBH. And um, I, Josh, I got the feeling from talking to you that the, at least the way you run your operation now the li liability questions don't keep you up at night. They're not what you spend, thank you, most of your time on. It's not these liabilities. Not what? <laughs> not, not these liabilities. Okay. Uh, Does somebody have a mic for a minute for Josh? Thank you. What we were talking about last night is that we have not had any meaningful uh, complaints or problems with fair use in the last nine years. Uh, tiny little issues, they get resolved quickly at next to no cost to the station. Okay, and is your perspective at NET, when you're looking down the road, I imagine you're, you're considering uh, similar things in, in rolling out a more open um, environment. It, it, are your worries similar to Sue's? Our, our concern is how do we sustain whatever kind of uh, program this turns into because it's not going to be a money maker on its own. So do we become a, is this just another thing that we, we look for philanthropic funding or is there some kind of business model that helps it uh, keep itself going. That's that's the primary concern for us. But if I, if 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 I um, found money for you to say take one of your programs, um, American Masters, and it was filled with as it is, archival material or interviews or whatever, and even uh, programs uh, retrospectively that hadn't been cleared for um, internet use, what would your reaction be if you had the money to do it? If we had the money to do it, it depends on the series. American Masters is the toughest one because we have private arrangements with uh, the estates and, and a lot of third-party rights holders there. So we, we get into we have the same trust issue that Frontline has uh, with with how we agree to let that stuff out there. But we have been going into our archive and identifying programs now where we don't feel uh, there is any kind of moral obligation or, or, or significant contractual obligation uh, so that we're going to start, you know, putting our big toe into this area. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm going to quickly show you some of what Creative Commons looks like and how it works because uh, uh, we've been talking about it, but I'm not sure everybody has seen it. So here's, the, here's our home page. Um, it's changed over the years, and now we've m mostly organized it, as you can see on the left here, with the type of work that one might either wish to um, to use or to uh, become a licensor, make available to the world. And the whole reason this was developed be is because of the World Wide Web and the Internet. Uh, and, this, and the new law that made it um, so that as soon as pen left paper and there was, uh, the work was uh, more or less complete, uh, copyright attached to that work. So you had all these works 
um, more under copyright protection than before, certainly, because the copyright law made them um, under protection immediately. And at the same time, a large number of people and more and more every day who are interested in finding work. And then the question was, what can you use? And is there a way to connect these people who are interested in using the work with people who had made it? That was the reason um, for Creative Commons, and that's still our reason for existing. The licenses are now organized. I'll show them to you. So for instance, um, I clicked on audio here, and you can see you can find work or publish work. There's a, a tool, you just click on it and it publishes your work. So for instance, here, here, are, two, here are three types of licenses, a standard license, a sampling license, and a share of the music license. So with the standard license, which is um, available in most other forms of media, I click on the standard license. Uh, here is what you have to do. You have to choose, um, you have to make some choices, some toggle switches on your license. Do you want to allow commercial uses, yes or no? Let's say no. Do you want to allow modification? Yes, as long as others share alike. The jurisdiction, we've got a lot of countries here. So let's just say uh, the generic, which is the U.S. jurisdiction. Um, the format of your work, uh, audio to make sure, and then um, I can say more about the work if I want to, but otherwise I just select the license, and this thing is going to spit out a license. And it says, the license that I've chosen is Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share Alike, and here's what the license uh, looks like. And then there, this is the sort of um, layperson's version. If you go behind this, there's a, a lawyer's version and as you can see up here, there's a lot of uh, different languages and legal systems, basically, that it translates to. The interoperability between legal systems, I should say, is imperfect. <laughs> so here I'm searching for uh, something I want. I hit search. It's going to give me um, three, uh, the internal ser server, somebody's asleep at Creative Commons, but still I can try it with one of these search engines. So, okay, the reason I'm playing this one um, is because a, a discussion I had uh, at um, at uh, GBH last week led me to believe that um, some uh, people who are interested in open access somehow think that Creative Commons is a copyright laundering machine. <laughs> um, as if all you have to do, uh, you've got some work and you want to make it available to the public and the answer is tag it with the Creative Commons license. And um, Here's what the result would be if you just did that. Let's see if I can get this right. Oh, I had it. Oh, yes. We need to do this with our partners at Flickr. Remember when you really have to wait a long time? Hmm. <laughs> well, we'll get to it in a minute. What we end up with is this one. Um, a shredded, uh, at least in terms of copyright law, a shredded uh, work. So um, I, I, I want it to be clear to everybody that the solution to uh, copyright um, problems and legal problems is not to tag it with a Creative Commons license. A Creative Commons license can define uh, the rights that the licensor wants to give out. They're well thought through. Um, we're very sure, or we're quite sure that they'll stand up and they save people a lot of work, which is why OpenCourseWare and others have chosen it. But it doesn't eliminate um, 
copyright problems. The solution to eliminating copyright problems I figured out um, while we're here. It's changed the law, right? So here's how we do that. Uh, the way we change the law is for GBH to have a contest. We've had a contest of uh, some sorts, and we've given away Macs and that sort of thing, but uh, iPods, we're not going to do that. Uh, you're going to have a contest, and the contest is who can take GBH material um, online and make the best attack ads for incumbents against their opponents? Right. <laughs> With our name on them. With your name on them. And they, first of all, incumbents win most of the time anyhow, and your, the attack ads will be so effective that all these people will be in your debt, and the very next term of Congress will have exactly what you need. <laughs> so that, that, that was the very best I could come up with for how to totally eliminate um, your problems. Um, uh, there, there certainly will be risks that um, have to be taken. You'll have to evaluate the risks as you go along. I'd much rather be sitting where I am than sitting on suicide, <laughs> right. who, has, who has to actually work all these things out. Um, on, the, on the editorial side, I'm um, for figuring out when it makes sense and when it doesn't make sense. And there are probably going to be a lot of ways to take half measures in the beginning of their worth experimenting with. Um, at the Berkman Center, when I started, there was a project, um, I think it was called Open Law, and the idea of this project was that um, the Berkman Center should show the way how lawyers can take, in their lawsuits, make everything open, all, the, uh, all their legal work, all the, the work that would normally be protected by attorney-client privilege. This is kind of a lawyer's joke, anyhow. Um, and that it would have benefits, and the benefits would be that you would have the, uh, the world of people who are interested in your side helping you. You would have law students and lawyers who had free time and like, like film, um, like amateur filmmakers or filmmakers working on your case for you. But of course the other side is that the other side would know exactly what you were doing. So sometimes, and in fact, sometimes that seems like it would make sense in cases that have a, a important rhetorical value, in cases where you didn't, the, the outcome depended much more on a public relations battle than something else. But so uh, uh, similarly, um, I think you have to balance when it makes sense um, and when it um, doesn't make sense. On the funding side, um, I'm, I'm wrapping up? OK. On the funding side, I have nothing at all to say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to say something while okay. you pass me the cord? Yeah. yeah. Just quickly on the funding side, I was really interested. Just further down there. You just need the internet or this no, too? Just that. I'm not as cool as you with the Mac, so. On the um, funding side, um, I, I just say we could all take a look at two things. What YouTube did on uh, last week, or was reported in the, in the Wall Street Journal on um, Monday or Tuesday, where they worked out a way to put back to the copyright owners, do you want some money or do you not want some money? It may not be a lot now, and so maybe you have to figure out a way to begin to think about the way Paul Gerhardt is from BBC, a way to have some income stream to support what you're doing. It may not be a, a, um, a fire hose of money, but it, it may uh, work out to be something, and it may not be stiffing the uh, copyright proprietors. Awesome. Thank you so much. So thank you, Judith, and to your colleagues for hosting this uh, event. It's a wonderful, wonderful forum and an honor to be here. My name is John Palfrey, and um, I followed Eric Saltzman um, today in more ways than one. He was the uh, executive director of the Berkman Center um, when I took over that job several years ago, and I've been striving to fill his big shoes ever since. Um, I'm highly cognizant of the fact that um, the only thing worse than being uh, a lawyer on a panel talking about rights issues in front of people who do something interesting for a living is being the third of three lawyers on such a panel, <laughs> um, even when they're as dynamic as Sue and Eric. Um, so uh, I promise not to um, take up the full balance of my time. Um, uh, what I wanted to um, talk briefly about um, is uh, the future, um, the future of Internet and the future of um, digital media. Um, at the Berkman Center, one of the three areas that we've studied very closely in the last several years has been this transition between uh, analog um, and digital media um, and its various ramifications, effects on innovation, effects on teaching and learning and so forth. Um, we've been supported by the MacArthur Foundation, Elspeth and others, um, and, and more recently on an extension of that project um, to look at the what we call the digital learning challenge, to consider 
the way um, that copyright standing uh, in the way of, um, in certain instances, um, uh, the use of digital materials uh, in teaching and learning. Um, and outside, you can find uh, copies of the paper, um, which I'd very much encourage you to um, uh, take with you if you would. Um, what we mean by digital learning uh, is several things, and I'll um, only talk about a little bit of it. Um, the idea here is uh, to think very broadly about what it means to be teaching um, in an era in which many of the, the kids that are coming through the system are digital natives. They were born digital um, uh, as opposed to learning to be digital and are um, often uh, thinking in terms of research as online search rather than going to a library, um, that very often they're experiencing um, this converged world um, that's something that we only dreamed of a few years ago. Um, sometimes that means uh, actually doing things in a classroom, but it, um, I think in many ways it also means, uh, in the capacious definition, um, the kinds of things that Evie um, and others at GBH are thinking about doing, that many of you are doing uh, here and extending beyond broadcast um, with your materials and thinking about non-traditional forms of teaching and making information available much more broadly. And I think you can come at this problem and see the open content issue as a problem uh, from at least two directions. So I come at it from the perspective of hope and wonder, um, thinking about all the wonderful things that could be done in a digital environment. Um, but I think you could also come at this problem from a purely practical point of view and say, look, if I'm trying to produce something and I know I have to distribute it um, at some point in a way other than traditional broadcast in order to reach my audience, how do I overcome the rights problems that, um, that Sue has talked about? Even if you are not a forward-looking uh, person in this sense, even if you just are wondering how do I do my job in a basic sense um, when the legal regime was created in the 18th century and hasn't yet been updated, uh, much less for the 20th century, um, but certainly not for the future that we see ahead of us. Um, in looking at this uh, research paper, which um, I should say off the bat, I was not um, uh, the principal author of it. It was Terry Fisher, um, for whom I'm standing in today, and a research fellow named Bill McGovern. Um, we looked closely at four case studies. Um, they were uh, totally fascinating. They're all available on the web, um, and each of them informed different aspects of this problem. Um, the most important and relevant one, of course, is that um, WGBH, um, Sue and Jay Falkov and others very kindly um, put themselves forward and subjected themselves to the study of a case um, which was looking at moving content beyond broadcast um, and when the law stays still. Um, it's a fascinating review of the problems that, uh, that some of which Sue has alluded to, um, but really get to this question of um, if you are seeking to do something even just a little bit innovative, if not totally innovative, um, what stands in your way and what are the problems um, of the outdated copyright laws um, in this context? Um, what we came up with based on these um, uh, series of case studies, um, and again it's elaborated in 110 sort of slightly stultifying pages um, in this white paper. Um, the thing that surprises me as an aside about this white paper is that um, uh, for the last month or so since it was released, it is the number two download in SSRN, which is the sort of scholar's resource of all papers. Somehow I have no idea how this happened. I think it has to do with librarians who are wonderful um, and who uh, think this is important. Um, but the four problem categories that we uh, identified through these case studies and through research um, are unfavorable or unclear law, which seems um, to be most likely um, uh, the culprit, uh, strict technological copying limitations, DRM for short, um, burdensome rights clearance issues, even when you can get around the legal issues, how do you actually functionally do it? Um, and lastly, uh, sort of a norms problem, excessively cautious uh, gatekeepers. Um, so um, uh, with uh, regards to uh, these problems, I'm going to put them in four categories common to uh, legal scholars as um, Larry Lessig's four modes of regulation, which are law, code, norms, and markets. Um, the first and the most sort of dominant thing that we heard from people that we talked to is that law stands in the way. Um, the, very often the thing at issue, of course, is the fair use exception to copyright. So um, in a digital world or in a pre-digital world, um, whenever you create something, you obviously um, retain all rights in it, and sometimes that's um, a very good thing. Um, but there are many rights that, um, that uh, are are only partial in the sense that other people can do things with it, um, as you well know. One of the limitations being um, Section 107 in the copyright law, um, as Lawrence Lessig calls it, fair use, though, is really the right to hire a lawyer. It's not a clear um, statement. It's a four-factor balancing test, and obviously if you have wonderful lawyers um, like Sue, you're in good shape, but um, uh, even then, uh, you, uh, uh, you can't necessarily get clarity ex ante before you do something. There are a variety of other laws, um, Sue noted, uh, one of those um, her presentation, there's also the TEACH Act and others that very specifically are meant to achieve greater clarity um, for people in your position, um, but which don't do so um, in, a, uh, in a way that's uh, significant um, in a digital sense. 
The second of the barriers is code, not um, at all surprising. Um, Eric couldn't get on internet. I'm not going to try to get on internet. Um, uh, um, but uh, as you may know, uh, the many people when releasing content um, do so uh, with good reason, with some controls in terms of how it's distributed. Sometimes those controls obviously are um, uh, more excessive than in other cases. And very often this is done um, despite the opportunities of putting out information in a way that is, um, is le less protected or might uh, achieve broader distribution. Um, this is true not, though, the only, not just of people whose rights you might want to um, access in the commercial sense, but it's also true of educators um, and schools, as we found through this study. Um, despite the fact that many uh, people in the educational uh, realm would have a different view of uh, um, how you might want to reach out and how many people you might want to have access your, uh, your information, we were very surprised by the extent to which um, uh, technological protections were used in the academic setting um, in a very conservative way rather than seeking um, to make access more broadly available. Um, this map may be familiar um, to many of you, but it's the DVD coding regions. And one of the things that we found was um, the difficulties that even this relatively simple form um, of protections causes um, in terms of uh, access across national board, uh, boundaries. Um, Here's one of the findings from the report that I thought uh, sort of made this point particularly well in the, in the code. Um, and it, uh, it relates, of course, to um, uh, the uh, way in which content is protected. Um, here, in other, as in other case studies, this is looking at the use of filmmakers of DVDs. Many educational uses of content are proceeding despite the obstacles. Um, but in this case, the benefits are realized only by breaking the law. So we found extensive um, situations in which people who were teaching um, or who were doing things that otherwise seemed to be um, rational and good and desirable um, were turned into lawbreakers by the extent to which the protections um, in some cases were overzealous. Um, I think this is something that in um, Internet law we find all the time, that we have 60 million plus Americans, more than those who voted for George W. Bush for president, being file sharers and breaking the law, we have um, an extraordinary situation in which um, very often the things that people do um, that have become sort of a norm uh, are in fact illegal. Um, the third of the, of the restrictions is uh, not surprisingly the market. Um, if a clearance is determined to be uh, necessary, an educator obviously must go through a series of different steps. And this educator might be um, someone in the public broadcasting system as, um, as opposed to just a, um, just a uh, lowly university teacher. Um, there are a series of steps, of course, that you have to go through. But one of the things that we found was even when you could go through these steps, obviously, um, and pay, um, sometimes paying wasn't, uh, wasn't enough. One famous case um, that's being litigated now is a case against the Joyce estate, which you may have read about, that Lawrence Lessig and our colleagues out at Stanford are bringing, um, where an academic was seeking to um, publish on the web a series of archival materials about um, one of uh, James Joyce's children, um, and the extent to which they couldn't even clear the rights. Um, the publishers couldn't even clear the rights in this case. Um, and uh, so even if you could get over the, the sort of practical hurdles of doing this, that you can't um, accomplish that even when you might in fact have that fair, uh, that fair use. Um, this is a, one of the other findings from the case study about uh, WGBH. Um, as GBH discovered, when seeking licenses for internet streaming outlets from NBC um, to C-SPAN adopted such wait-and-see approaches to licensing digital uses of content. So um, even when you might go to the trouble of seeking to license it, um, they will have a trouble getting um, the, uh, the ability to do that even when you're willing to pay. Um, and the last of the four boundaries um, being social norms, that often the key intermediaries um, are ignorant, greedy, or chicken. Um, that's true of many of us, um, and, uh, and I think part of it is a lack of, um, a lack of education about what, in fact, fair use might protect. But I think there's much more to it than that, which is actually a deeper um, ingrained cultural problem. Um, so what are the paths toward reform? I will not go through all of the things that we put in this paper, um, but would encourage you to um, read it if you care to. Um, I think the most difficult, but also the most important in many ways, is a broader and clearer um, form of fair use, particularly um, in the context of educational and non-commercial uses. It is, of course, one of the four factors in the fair use um, test, but it gives very, very little assurance to anyone um, who's tried to do this that you have this as sort of an excuse. It is by no means um, a clear uh, a clear excuse. The second is um, that came particularly out of the GBH um, uh, case study was the need to update the public broadcasting exceptions, that they are outdated and are not meant for a digital error um, by any means. And there are a variety of other paths toward reforms. Um, I'd be happy to post these um, slides somewhere, but rather than read through all of them and put you all to sleep, I will not, um, not read through all of them. Um, 
But I do think that there are uh, also some uh, things that can be done that are not legal in nature. So obviously changing um, Title 17 in the Copyright Act um, would be a good thing in many ways, but I think that there are um, uh, some things. Clearly, Creative Commons is a very important bit of this. Eric says it's not totally a washing machine. Of course that's so, but it does grease the skids um, of being able to do this. Um, I also think that there's a massive need to change the gatekeepers' attitudes in this. So there are many, many gatekeepers uh, involved, and that uh, if uh, it's not even a matter of taking risk. I think it's taking appropriate risks and realizing what the rights are involved um, that could go a long way. Um, I wanted also, though, to put this in uh, an international context um, very briefly. As we're talking about um, troubles with open access or um, seeking to have this uh, more open content zone, it's important also to realize that um, uh, there are places where access to information is much less free than it is here in the United States. This is a um, uh, a very small graphic, but which shows the extent to which different countries, shown on the left, um, block certain kinds of access to information of their citizens, which is along the bottom. Um, and I realize this may seem like a stretch, um, but I did want to put the, the situation that we have in the United States in the context of a relatively open information environment, where in many places of the world a citizen can't access information, for instance, about the Thai coup that happened yesterday. The Thai government is one of several that, um, that do filter the Internet um, and so forth. Um, a second bit of context, which I won't go into, but is that um, these rules are quite different in Europe, as you might imagine. We did a parallel case study, um, which I'd refer you to if you have an interest in that um, uh, separately. Um, and then lastly, uh, before ceding to the uh, group overall, the conversation, um, uh, I think actually the most important thing is what all of you are doing in this room in some, um, in a very uh, important way, which is uh, to meet the challenge of uh, getting to a situation in which open content is more available. I think the biggest challenge is that you actually go out there and make this content and you make it completely wonderful and useful. Um, Check it out to see if you have the rights under a clip license, right? Some of the unions permit clip rights. If you had music, you might want to strip the music and put in something from a cleared record library, and I think there are ways to do that. Well, actually, let's say there's no music concerns. So it's just WG. It depends on what unions it is. I mean, some of them don't allow clips at all. So no, this is deep. You know, this would be after DGA and, and everything. DGA. Yeah. Well, if you cut it to two minutes, you can say it's promotion. <laughs> if you do it five minutes, you'll take a risk, and you'll defend it just like we've defended the video blog, you know, the video, um, the the vodcast and the podcast that we've done. And I mean, is there any point of doing it? Does okay, my the washing machine thing. Can I license anything under Creative Commons? Any which way with that? Yeah. Yes, but what's the question? Can can you attach a Creative Would that Commons? Help me in any which way? Uh, that won't help you with the unions. No, but I mean just. Any which way? I think you got the wrong message out of the out of the that washing machine slide. It doesn't it doesn't clean up uh, rights oh, I know and problems. It, clean up the it may it might make it look better because somebody might say a Creative Commons license. Oh well, that can't be of any use to anybody. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, m maybe it's useful to actually just break down the inbound rights versus the outbound rights, That's right? What I want to just yeah, be yeah. Very particular about a very so uh, just in a broad sense, anything you do in terms of licensing it to somebody else doesn't necessarily have any effect on what happens in terms of the rights that you've cleared on the inbound sense, right? So you need to get it in shape at the point at which you decide to release it, and then you decide, what of those rights am I going to give to somebody in an outbound sense? And um, the Creative Commons will be unrelated to the clearance process that you go through on the inbound sense. You have to go through each of your elements and see what that five-minute clip consists of and figure out what kind of risk you're willing to take and see for each of them. I, what... I have too many things to drill down through, so I'll talk to Susan offline. Okay. <laughs> but it, but the, maybe one, one of the points is, if you're saying to the inbound side, 
I'm going to release it. I'm trying to clear it so I can release it on the Creative Commons. Does that help or hurt you? I think from a union perspective, it does neither. You have limitations that are unrelated to, to that. Using a Creative Commons is not going to make anything better because it, those are the, the union agreements dictate how you can use that content. If you don't have that right under your collective bargaining agreements, then that's a risk that you, you're taking. The fact that you're going to make it available under a Creative Commons license is kind of, I think, derailing. When you're doing these negotiations, when you work, did you bring up open content in these negotiations? When we met, went to sit with the Writers Guild last November, uh, we didn't bring up Creative Commons or open content specifically. What we were focusing on is trying to expand the rights that we have um, in the education space, particularly in teacher's domain, to be able to give kids the right in schools to be able to mix and mash. And actually, we didn't limit our discussion to the school classroom because we included, because of all the input that I got from, from our team with Abby and the, other, the rest of the teacher's domain team, all the ways that kids need to access this content. So when we sat down with the Writers Guild, we said, this is what we need. And they weren't buying it. So they, they didn't buy it until I said to, the, to Mona Magan, who's the head of the Writers Guild East, so Mona, you have a 15-year-old daughter. How is she using media in the classroom? When she wants to write her term paper or her PowerPoint that puts, that puts any of us to shame, and she wants to include a three-minute clip from Nova, which describes photosynthesis at, you know, in her PowerPoint or, or in her term paper, that's what we're talking about, giving her the right to do that. How could you have a problem with that, okay? So they gave us a limited right to kind of expand for educational purposes. So I think the thing is, for us, educational, once it's out there in the universe, which is why I was talking about trying to make a version of a Creative Commons license, which we'll be talking to Eric and his team about, um, to see if we can at least limit it to say, listen, we understand that there's a restriction for educational use, okay? We understand the World Wide Web is not only about educational use, but we're doing our best to put some kind of gates on it so that our primary focus is making this available for, for educational purposes in schools or homes or whatever. So you can try to do it. And that was as far as we got with the Writers Guild. We have yet to sit down with the Anthony and after because they're in such a, a, a disorganized state right now. I think it's fascinating to hear from the panel the work that's being done here to uh, you know, both explore how the existing rights regime can be changed and the kind of negotiations that you're undertaking with rights holders. And obviously we're doing the same kind of work in the BBC as well. But I just wanted to introduce a sort of slightly more heretical stance here, which is to wonder why um, we're the right people to undertake this negotiation in the first place. Because we're talking about use beyond broadcasting. But we're broadcasters. And I, you know, I speak as a BBC employee as much as I do to people working in PBS. Are we the right people to negotiate with rights holders on the use of their material in a space that is beyond broadcast and that is beyond our current experience as well as being new to them. And it makes me wonder really whether we should be collaborating with the organizers of those spaces, you know, whether it's the new YouTubes and others, who, um, who are really interested in aggregating huge amounts of content and forcing through substantial changes in the way in which it's used. The idea that... Um, the, the idea of working with uh, other um, archive owners and other broadcasters to effectively put together what we call a kind of public lending rights system was an idea that came to me not from a broadcaster but from a rights owner who said, what you're describing is not broadcasting. It's like a public library system which people can take away and reuse or visual media. And I said, you're right. That's what it is. So I'm just wondering whether we ought to rethink the role that we're playing here. Yes, we have to push the boundaries and we have to work hard and we have to explain what's going on and we have to bring all of the stakeholders up to speed with us. But perhaps we also ought to be talking with the people that are, can help us to create the space in which users are going to use this material in an entirely different way. And I think that is beyond broadcasting. It's beyond the kind of traditional role of broadcasting that the BBC has identified as well. The reason we do it, of course, is we want our name on it. It's our material. You know, we want the credit. We want the credit for it being used in these exciting new ways. But I think if we separate that credit issue from the right to use it in the way we want it, we might be able to move forward. Just comment in brief. I think it's a completely wonderful concept, and one obviously where partnership is usually a good thing. But I think here it's 
extremely important. Um, sometimes the partner might be a commercial partner like YouTube, which obviously has the, the mo at the moment. Um, but I think it's also universities, for instance, where I, mean, I think there's a role for leadership for lots of universities. And one example might be the debacle right now with Google Print and the extent to which the five libraries are you know, now in a big, two big lawsuits around it. Um, but I do think that, that, that um, various partnerships with other um, entities which have sort of a similar set of interests um, is super important. Paul, I'll give you just another data point. With Creative Commons in Europe, we've run into a problem with the collecting societies who have taken the position that if uh, one of their uh, performers licenses anything to Creative Commons, they won't represent that individual on any of their other work. They're just dumping. And so that's, that's, you know, that's sort of the nuclear option as far as uh, uh, musicians uh, or, or rights holders are concerned because uh, while they may want to use something under Creative Commons license and make it available, they still have to, they need their income and we are not a source of income. Um, and uh, we are talking to the collecting collection societies, collecting societies. One of the things they're interested in is something we haven't done yet, which is a limited license term. Right now our licenses are perpetual. Um, and I don't know, I, I don't want to uh, handicap where that is going to go yet, but we um, have the user side who are saying to the collecting societies, some of them, the powerful ones, uh, we're just not okay with this. You know, for some of the people in the, uh, in the negotiation, um, the collecting societies have all the power, but on some of the others, if the collecting societies want to have those musicians in their stable, they may have to listen to people who say, we want the option for a Creative Commons license for certain things. So I think, it's, I think your point is a very smart one. One has to look at where the leverage is, and it may not always be on this side of the uh, camera. Yeah. 